Over the last few weeks, I've had overwhelming, though not unanimous, support for the last few videos I've put out. So I do thank you for all your comments. Out of the less than positive comments, one of the most considered and ill, Ill in depth I've received has been from a chap by the name of David Clifford. So I thought we'd dedicate one whole video to answering his criticisms. Defending liberty is not easy. Defending privacy is harder still. And Anon anonymity even harder than that. I have thought long and hard about my defence of these things, but it remains difficult to counter some of the pernicious arguments put forward by those who would deprive us of our natural inclination to freedom. I'll try and answer paragraph by paragraph and I'd like to say that, although we seem to disagree, David, I do thank you for your input. He begins. I've listened to some of your clips about the issue of freedom, privacy and state surveillance, so I offer you some home truths about these matters for your consideration. So far, so good. But I'll try not to react too heavily to the hectoring note of your home truths. He continues, what is freedom? As I understand it, freedom is the state of being able to act or not act or to change or not change without constraint. In other words, having nothing to prevent you from doing whatever you fancy. It only takes a second to realize that what I would call absolute freedom, as described above, is unattainable. Freedom is a relative term simply because absolute freedom is an illusion and so there can be only degrees of freedom within a particular context. Yet despite this, people use the term with reckless abandon and never think to first explain the sort of freedom that they are seeking or the sort of freedom they are trying to protect. Well, there's not much to disagree with there, David. Of course freedom is a relative term. However, I don't believe that I am using the word, word recklessly. And I agree that absolute freedom is not only practically unattainable it is probably also undesirable. He continues, There are several things that you can say about freedom. Firstly, there have always been limitations on a person's freedom. The most obvious example is that we're confined with our own, within our own bodies and by the laws of nature. But we are also subject to the will of thugs who are in charge of the state in which we happen to live at any particular time. Indeed, there's nowhere in the world where ordinary people are free from the will of some group of thugs. Granted. But I'm not looking to transcend the laws of nature, David. Uh, he clarifies next. Before I go any further, and for the purposes of this comment, I define thugs as men who think it is okay to impose their will on everyone else by force, and who have the means to do so. I define ordinary people as all those individuals who are not thugs. OK, David, considering your definition of thugs, I would, say, I would have to say that governments can and do fit nicely into that, into that definition. The problem being is that in a two-party state, the US or the UK for instance, by necessity one gets to have one vote every five years and in the intervening period the governing party can, and often does, operate in the thuggish manner you describe. The justification is that they have a mandate. But what they are really saying is that they can do whatever they like for the next five years purely on the basis of having a parliamentary majority. Now I'm not saying that I know what can be done about that coming as it does with the territory of a democracy, but it is the reason why I would prefer a proportional vote so that governments would have to constantly negotiate with the oppositions they have to deal with if that results in governments having to water down their campaign promises, it's a price I'd be willing to pay. Because the over, bigger overall majority a government has, the more thuggish it becomes. Secondly, he says, Secondly, one person's freedom can often be the expense of another person's freedom. All too often, when arguing for their own freedom, people will forget about the impact that the freedom which they seek will have on the freedom of others. Again, I wouldn't argue with your premise here, David. 
and I do subscribe to the principle that people should be allowed to do whatever they wish so long as that does no harm to others. That's the caveat. I'm not advocating that I should be allowed to drive my Land Rover over my next door neighbour's vegetable patch or even the flower beds in my local park in order to exercise my freedom. That of course would violate the principle of no harm to others. Excuse me for saying so, but I would have thought that was obvious. He continues, Thirdly, one person can feel free in a situation which another person does not feel free. The sense of freedom is personal and therefore subjective. Now, we are starting to enter some pretty muddy waters here, David. I'll concede that a sense of freedom is subjective, but a sense of anything is subjective. Should I not be allowed to walk along the same street as a woman at night because it may make her not feel free by her, by her, imagining, her imagining herself under threat? Are we to judge the levels of freedom a person enjoys on the basis of how it feels to someone else? As any cursory glance at statistics of violent crime, for instance, will, will reveal, the group most likely to suffer violence is young men. Young women may feel at risk, but the facts say otherwise. Right, this, uh, he continues, this is quite a long passage, so um, I'll just have to go through it. He says, so as to your argument about privacy and the freedom from unwanted surveillance, I would say this. Firstly, as soon as you were born, your birth certificate was registered by the state. You were also given a national insurance number, which I think equates to a social security number in other countries, as well as a national health service number. A little later, you would have been given a number relating to the school which you attended, and there's a record somewhere of the examinations you, that you took and the grades that you achieved. You've probably got a passport. You will also have a driving license and you're recorded as the owner of the vehicle that you drive. The authorities are able to match your name and the number of the vehicle log with the insurance policy in your name that permits you to drive on public roads. Your name, I think, is also attached to the MOT certificate. That's a roadworthiness certificate. That relates to your vehicle. You will also be recorded as the holder of a TV license. Some of these licenses will have your photograph on them and these systems were in place long before surveillance cameras, mobile phones and email records. So don't kid yourself that you have any right to privacy or that you ever had any such thing in the past. Right, the fact that I have, have, that I have various documents relating to me personally for the purposes of identification is undeniable. And these are things that come with the territory of a modern bureaucratic state. In order for it to function, these things are on the whole necessary. But it does not follow at all that just because I was issued with a birth certificate, a driving license or a passport, that I must then surrender any aspirations I have ever had to prevent the state from looking into the most intimate details of my private life. That's one of the most massive leaps of logic I think I've ever heard. Sure, I have a driving license that identifies me in the case of an accident, say, or in the event that the police have probable cause that I might have done something illegal. Remember that, David? Probable cause? Or what about being innocent until proven guilty? These are the bedrocks of our legal system. They are not anachronisms to be brushed aside by overzealous policemen who believe that every person they stop, search, question and arrest is probably guilty. Yes, I have a TV licence, but again it, doesn't, again it doesn't follow that with a modern smart interactive television, just because it is now possible for the authorities to know what I am watching, as well as being able to listen to my private conversations in the private space of my living room, it absolutely does not mean that they should. And I have a car and insurance documents. And by having a number plate on my car, I have agreed to surrender some, not all, some of my anonymity in that regard. 
and the amount of anonymity I have surrendered is precisely this. If I break the law and I am witness doing so, my number plate can probably identify me. It's not certain since someone else could be driving my car. If I happen to be in the vicinity of a crime and a witness notes and remembers my number plate, I can be a line of inquiry for the police. Now I do not object to that since that is the luck of the draw. What I object to is the unblinking eye of electronic surveillance as represented by automatic number plate recognition. With ANPR, my lawful activities are logged, filed, indexed and stored without any probable cause that I have ever done anything wrong. So why is it stored? There are two reasons. One supposedly practical reason and one that is much more sinister. Firstly, it is stored because it is easy. Since it is so easy, why not store it? But there is another reason. It is stored for the purposes of future possible judgment. So that in the future it can be established, or at least implied, that I was where I should not have been according to the prevailing fashion of the time. Maybe I was having an affair. Maybe I was frequenting a strip club, a gay club, a transvestite club. Maybe I was attending a fascist or a communist meeting. Maybe I was going line dancing. Perhaps I could be outed as an Elton John fan. None of these things are illegal, but they could and will be used to exert pressure in the future in order to compel me to do or not do something that is at, off at odds with the government or the social mores of the time. I am for targeted surveillance, not least because it is so much more effective. Most people hate speed cameras. I don't, because at least in the case of speed triggered cameras, like Gatso's for instance, they are the definition of targeted surveillance. They only take your picture if you are speeding. The law abiding motorist can sail past them unhindered unhindered and, and this is the crucial difference, unrecorded. And that is the beauty and the justice of targeted surveillance. He continues, now the state has authorised the installation of surveillance cameras because they have a responsibility for the safety of all its citizens including you. Nobody likes the idea very much but most of us recognise that many thousands of individuals are able to carry on with their lives today as a direct result of the police and security services being able to scan the records left by those cameras, apprehend criminals or terrorists and put them behind bars. In fact, for all you know, you might be one of those thousands of people. So, the state has a responsibility for the safety of all its citizens. Agreed. But does it not also have a responsibility for the liberty of all its citizens? If not, why not? Why is safety to be more prized than liberty? Perhaps it is to you. It isn't to me. Because I prize liberty far more, infinitely more, than safety. The world is a dangerous place. We could make it safer if we all sat around clothed in bubble wrap having our meals delivered so we don't have to go out there. We could have our food liquidised too, for good measure, just in case we break, break a tooth. And yes, I might be one of those people who has been saved by the security services, but I don't want their protection, not at that price. They haven't asked me whether they could remove my anonymity and my privacy for the sake of my security. They didn't ask, they just took it. And I want it back. So I will kid myself that I have a right to privacy because that is my right. It's everybody's right and it's your right too. Maybe you don't want it, but just because you don't, just because you are content to trade your hard won freedom for the cold comfort of a padded cell, 
don't kid yourself that everybody is like you. So he continues, do you seriously think that the authorities have nothing better to do than spy on you? They have enough trouble carrying out the surveillance that's essential to keeping everyone safe. They don't have time to, wa to waste watching people who are just getting on with their lives. And here we get to the crux of the issue. Do I think the authorities are interested in me? No, I don't. You know why? Because I'm powerless. And that's how they like it. They want me to be powerless. They won't be interested in me if I remain powerless. But what if I wasn't powerless? What then, eh? What if, heaven forbid, what I'm doing started to make a difference? What if I got a lot of support? What if people started to get tired of all this surveillance? What if they started to see the asymmetry of an all-seeing CCTV camera on a 30-foot pole protected by barbed wire, seeing everything that they're doing, but that they couldn't see who was watching them? What if they started to climb those poles, spray paint the cameras, cover them with plastic bags, or even tear them from their fixings? What if what I was saying, or somebody like me, started to threaten the, con the control that they have over the population? Don't you think they'd watch me then? Don't you think they would go through their ANPR records trying to find things to shame and embarrass me? Don't you think they would start trawling through my internet history to see what kind of pornography I was watching? Searching through their databases to find dirt on me, to discredit me. So, do I think they're interested in me? No, but only because I'm a nobody. If I was any kind of threat to them, they'd be interested. You can be sure of that. So he continues, we're both fortunate enough, we're both fortunate enough, as you pointed out in one of your clips, to live in a democracy with a comparatively good record on human rights and the rule of law. I think you use the term a free country. If you were living in communist China or Iran or Saudi Arabia, I doubt whether you would have dared produce the clips that you have. But in the UK, in the UK, you can do so without fear. You can even get thousands of views if you mention Jordan Peterson, who seems to have become the David Beckham of YouTube. Yes, David, we are fortunate to live where we do, but we are on borrowed time. Would I have dared to produce the clips I have if I lived elsewhere? Probably not. But be very sure, I am afraid. I'm afraid because we have forgotten what it means to be free. And we have forgotten what it takes to gain freedom. And most of all, we have forgotten that a free society needs to be maintained. If we neglect it, it will fail us. This next paragraph says... I fully accept that you feel uncomfortable with the idea that people can, at any time, be watching you without you knowing it. Religious people are well used to it, of course. They believe that their God is watching them every second of their lives, including when they're asleep. Moreover, they believe that their God actually knows what they're thinking. Just imagine that. But they don't seem to mind. If you ask them, they'll explain that it's okay because their God loves them and cares about them. So what are you saying here, David? That we should treat our government with the same reverence that people treat the Almighty? I can't think of anything more dangerous. I'm not a religious person, but I'm familiar with the idea of the all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient God. But that's their relationship with God. That's their conscience. That's the Lord is my witness. What people mean when they say that is that despite there being no earthly witnesses to the crime that they are being accused of, the Lord knows of their innocence and will protect them and judge them accordingly. But that's God's business, not the government's. Conflating the two is a serious error. Government is a tool 
our tool. People revere God. Some people, like myself, revere the country itself. But government is not to be revered because it absolutely does not mean the same thing as country. That reminds me of a soldier who was interviewed when he was on the way to fight in the Falkland Islands. Dying for Queen and country is one thing, he said. Dying for Mrs Thatcher is quite another. He's coming to the end here. So, so here's the real issue that, in my opinion, you should be focusing on. It's not the presence of cameras, it's whether or not you can trust the state and the agents of the state. There are lots of people who are becoming increasingly concerned about the sovereignty of the state and, by implication, the sovereignty of the people. There's a major test of this at the present time within the Brexit controversy. Well, David, that is just the point. The presence of cameras is the issue, since the state and its agents can never be trusted. And nor should they be. It doesn't matter who is controlling the cameras or who is watching them. The issue is that the safeguards are little more than pathetic. We've got nobody watching the watchers. As it happens, and maybe this is where we might agree, I am pro-Brexit. I was in two minds, but came in as mildly Brexit. After witnessing the various attempts to undermine the result, my position has hardened. In a way, and I'm being maybe I'm being naive, but I do see it as an opportunity. However, there is a nasty authoritarian streak running through the British establishment, which I fear will result in an ever more powerful state. We may be free from Europe, right enough, but what good is that if we sink into fascism? The opportunity is, I believe, a British Bill of Rights that enshrines the freedom of the British people and that cannot be undermined by the expediency of a parliamentary majority. And that's a real prize to aim for. That is something meaningful to pursue, to quote Professor Peterson, rather than something expedient which is what I fear we will end up with. Uh, he continues, I would respectfully suggest, therefore, that you start to think about your privacy and your personal freedom in the context of the state, its role and the concentration of its power, rather than going on about some stupid cameras which have been put there for very sensible and practical reasons. There's plenty of stuff on YouTube to get your teeth into and to comment upon. Well, David, I thank you for your suggestions, but I would like to suggest one to ponder yourself. Jordan Peterson, or the David Beckham of the internet, as you refer to him, questions the motivations of those who announce they are standing up for this group or that group, or this position or that position. Rather in the way that he quotes Orwell's famous phrase, these people, uh, middle class socialists, don't really love the poor, they just hate the rich. In modern parlance, these people are, are the classic social justice warriors. He suggests that one must carefully examine their stated aims in order to find out what is going on. Why do they say that? What are they like? What do they really want? What's in it for them? So I will declare an interest, a selfish interest. That selfish interest, what's in it for me, is that I want to live in a free country because that will benefit me. But what's your story, David? You've not declared an interest in what kind of society you'd like. What's in it for you? Try as I might, I just can't tell. <laughs>